Well, just to remind you, nine years ago today was my first Sunday to return as your pastor. Wow. Nine years. Where'd that time go? I was kind of figuring it up, you know, so far between our first uh, stint here and then returning. We've got almost 18 years of our lives invested here. And so, thanks for putting up with me. Um, and um, I don't know if I've got nine more years in me, but uh, we pray the Lord will just continue to bless. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful that he, keeps br he kept bringing us back here. Um, this, is going, this has been home to us more so than anywhere else we've ever lived. And it's going to be home to us from now on because uh, whenever the day comes that I can't do this anymore, I'm not going anywhere. I've got a nice place to live and I'm going to stay right where I am. So, it's Chattanooga. Is that what it is? Okay. Well, we're going back to the series today on why truth matters. And if unless that's Jesus, tell them to call back, okay? Um, <laughs> and today we're going to talk about why the sacrificial death of Jesus matters. Life has got all kinds of warnings. In fact, uh, everything you purchase at the store today has a warning label on it of some kind or another warning you against the improper use of this item or this product. And uh, some of them are just so ridiculous that they're comical. And I wanted to share a few of them with you. And believe it or not, every one of these is real. There's a label on a snow sled that says, Warning, sled may develop high speeds under certain snow conditions. <laughs> Well, what have you got a sled for in the first place? Or how about this one? This is on a fishing lure. Harmful if swallowed. You understand why they put these warnings on these packages. Somebody did this. Or how about this one? On a baby stroller. Remove child before folding. That's a good one. Or this is a good one. It's on a, on a laser printer. It says, do not eat toner. <laughs> Why would you even think about it? Now, let me give you one more. This is, a, you know those, um, card, those shields that they sell for you to put up in your windshield or your car to keep the, the sun out so it doesn't get so, doesn't get so hot in the car? On one of them it says, do not drive with sun shield in place. Boy, I tell you what, there, must, there are some, some winners out there that have tried these things and have made these warning labels necessary. And we laugh about them. We think, how, how could anybody be that foolish? Yet that's the same attitude that a lot of people have towards the Bible, and especially the Old Testament. And sometimes you can't blame them. I mean, just think about it. When you hear the words Old Testament, in a lot of people's minds, what comes up is something that's antiquated and out of date. You know, some people would suggest that the Old Testament really is irrelevant to us because Jesus came and he said, I have come uh, not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So with him coming, we really don't need the requirements of the law anymore, right? Right? And besides, the Old Testament has got all that blood and all that animal sacrifice. I mean, surely God has no intention for us to revert to ritual, does he? But I would suggest to you that the Old Testament is a lot more than just an ancient book of history. And it has a lot more relevance than just the Sunday school stories we use, to tell, we use it for to tell the kids. The Old Testament is powerful in itself, and it is effective. In fact, 
It's part of the complete Word of God. And here's what Paul had to say to Timothy. He said, all Scripture, and that includes old and new, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, the word that Paul is referring to is both the Old and New Testaments. Now, there's one book in particular that we really have a hard time with, and that's Leviticus. Uh, Leviticus is, is basically an instruction manual on how to run a butcher shop. Because it's, there's so much of it is based around the sacrifice. By the way, the sacrificial system was given to man for a specific purpose. And it was actually given to point man to God through the idea of a blood substitute. All right? So, so don't, don't lose sight of that. Now, Leviticus is, is part of what's called the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is made up of the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All of these are the history and the law of Moses. And we credit the authorship of these five books to Moses while he was leading Israel in that period of 40-some-odd years in the wilderness. The book derives its name from the tribe of Levi. Now, the Levites were the priests, and it was their responsibility to administer the law, to take care of the tabernacle, and to oversee all of this sacrificial process. Now, there's one key word that is the running theme through all of, all of Leviticus, and that word is holiness. Crucial to the understanding of the book of Leviticus is this. Holiness is not some abstract theological concept. Holiness is the foundation for the power of God's presence to work in the life of a nation, of a church, and an individual. The word holy appears in the book of Leviticus more than 80 times. And this call of God in the book of Leviticus is for the people of God to be holy and to be pure because God is holy and pure. Now the book's divided into two sections. The first ten chapters kind of give us a road map of how we can find our way to a holy God. But then chapters 11 through 27 kind of give us a road map of how we, in turn, can be holy in the process. You see, the first part tells us this is how you find God and, and realize that He is holy. But the second part is God saying to you, because I'm holy, therefore you be holy. So how do we get to the holy one? Uh, let's, let's talk about this. How, how do we get to Him, and how do we be like Him? Well, the way to the Holy One is through sacrifice. All right? Uh, I'm going to read nine verses of Scripture to you from, Levit from Leviticus chapter 1. So if you have your Bible, follow along with me. I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation, just simply because... It simplifies some of the terminology. The Lord called to Moses from the tabernacle and said to him, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you present an animal as an offering to the Lord, you may take it from the herd of your cattle or your flock of sheep and goats. If the animal you present as a burnt offering is from the herd, it must be a male with no defects. Bring it to the entrance of the tabernacle so you may be accepted by the Lord. Lay your hand on the animal's head and the Lord will accept its death in your place to purify you. 
making you right with him. Then slaughter the young bull in the Lord's presence, and Aaron's sons, the priests, will present the animal's blood by splattering it against all the sides of the altar that stands at the entrance to the tabernacle. Then skin the animal and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priests, will build a wood fire on the altar. They will arrange the pieces of the offering, including the head and the fat, on the wood burning on the altar. But the internal organs and the legs must first be washed with water. Then the priest will burn the entire sacrifice on the altar as a burnt offering. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Now I want you to, to focus in particular on the fourth verse that we read. The instructions were to lay your hand on the animal's head and the Lord will accept its death in your place to purify you, making you right with God. Why do you think there was so much blood in this Old Testament sacrificial system? You know, it's understood that the Old Testament sacrifices were specifically prescribed by God Himself and they received their meaning through the Lord's covenant that He established with Israel. And each, um, each offering was a gift that expressed the love that exists between the worshiper and between the God He is worshiping. And as well as this offering being considered a gift, every offering was an act of dedication, communion, atonement, and restitution. Now there are two things that are in view of the sacrifices that I want to point out to you. Atonement is the idea of being reconciled to God. But the substitution, the idea that the worshiper coming offers up the best he has in place of his sin and the sin of his family. So, what I want to ask you this morning, and I want you to ask this of yourself, just what do the sacrifices really mean to me. You know, the sacrificial system was pointing people um, to God's plan to save their lives. Let me say that again. The sacrificial system was pointing to God's plan to save them. See, the people of the Old Testament lived because another living thing died in their place. Now, th now think about this. You see this all throughout the Old Testament. You know, the most dramatic story, I think, that explains this is what took place with Abraham and Isaac. Uh, you, I'm, you know, I, I used to say, you remember the story. I don't, I, I've just about quit saying that because not everybody knows the stories anymore. But Isaac was the son of promise. He, God had promised Abraham an heir through which countless descendants would come. And that promise was Isaac. But when Isaac was just a boy, God said to Abraham, I want you to offer your son Isaac up to me. And so Abraham prepared the journey. He and his son Isaac and the servants started making their way towards Mount Sinai. And as they came in sight of the mountain, he told the servants, wait here. The boy and I will go there and we will worship. And here's the great statement of faith. We will worship and then we will return to you. Don't miss that. I believe Abraham made this journey believing if he offered his son up as a, as a sacrifice as God required, God would not leave him dead on the altar. 
But he would restore his life to him because Isaac was the son of promise. Don't forget that. And so they made their way up the mountain. They've got everything they need except a sacrifice. And Isaac asked his father the question. He said, Father, we have the wood. We have the fire. Where's the lamb? And Abraham looked at his son and he said, God will provide. And when they reached the place of the sacrifice, and, he, and Abraham began to prepare his son as he would an animal to be slain on the altar, Isaac did not resist. And when it came time for Abraham to thrust that death blow. The voice of God cried out and said, Whoa, Abraham, you don't have to do this. I know now <laughs> that you would not even withhold from me your only son. So I want you to know there are some key things in that that we miss that we can't afford to. The first is Abraham's statement that we will go and worship and then we will return and then his declaration that God will provide see that was God's plan from the beginning he's going to provide a way now the sacrificial system was also pointing to the seriousness of our sin now to many in our culture today, this seems to be uh, just so completely irrelevant. Because people don't see themselves today as needing forgiveness of sin. Because they don't see themselves as sinful. And the Bible is trying to help us understand that people are not sick. They are sinful. They are doing things... Not because of some psychological illness. They do them because the heart of man is evil. And their actions are the result of the sin that lives in their hearts. You know, the Bible says, If we say we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and refusing to accept the truth. Kim, I, I like, you caught up with me. All right. That's 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8. See, our problem is is not that we're damaged psychologically. Our problem is we have lived our lives so far away from God and we have sinned against Him. The prophet Isaiah said, but there is a problem. Your sins have cut you off from God. And because of your sin, He has turned away and will not listen anymore. So listen, sin is serious. It separates us from God both in this life and it will eternally separate us from Him when we pass over into eternity. So listen, sin ruins our relationship with God and it destroys our lives. And beloved, no amount of excuses can make it go away. The sacrificial system was also pointing to God's desire to forgive us. Again, God made a way. His moral, listen, God's moral laws never change. The consequences of God's law cannot be ignored. But He has provided a way through all of this so that we can be forgiven. And that's why the whole point of the sacrificial system was really a picture of God wanting to forgive us and making it possible for us to pass from death to life. Here's what the Bible says, Romans 4, 7 and 8. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. You see, beloved, when Moses asked, do you remember? No, you, I'm not going to do that. I don't know if you remember or not. If, read, the read the book. When God 
Moses asked God to reveal himself to him. And so the Lord took Moses and he tucked him up under the cleft of a rock. And he told him, don't look until I tell you to. And God began to pass by. All right, here's what it says. This is from Exodus 34. It says, the Lord passed in front of Moses calling out, Yahweh, the Lord. The God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Beloved, when we confess our sins, we confess them to a God who cares for us and is more than willing to forgive us. Oh, by the way, in that story, when God had passed by Moses, then he told him, you can look now. And all he saw was what he assumed was the backside of God as he went away, as he was going away. You see, he couldn't look on God's face. What does the scripture say? No one has looked upon God and lived that's why when the high priest would go into the, into the Holy of Holies, they tied a rope around his ankle. Because if he got in there, and if he wasn't worthy, and he's looking for the presence of God, <laughs> they're going to have to drag him out. Well, let's go, on, let's go on. The sacrificial system was pointing to God's perfect sacrifice. And as we read in the Scripture today, the person presenting the sacrifice would come. He would confess his sins over the sacrifice being offered. And then he would take his hands and put it on the head of the animal as he confessed. And as he's confessing, the animal's throat would be cut and he would die in that offerer's place. And the sins of the one bringing the offering would be transferred to the substitute. And they would stand there and watch as the animal's life expired. You see, the seriousness of their sin was demonstrated to them vividly. The, the lamb would be placed on the altar and offered up to God as a sacrifice. It is a life for a life. And the blood of the animal was offered up for their blood. The blood of the animal, far from being gory, was sacred. Because the life of the animal was in the blood. I mean, think about it. They can even substitute your heart today. And you can live. But if you don't have blood... There's no life. The life in the blood was passed on to the one whose sins were being atoned for. And the animal was then taken off the altar. The one bringing the sacrifice would then stand while they basically cooked it on the altar. And he would take some of that roasted lamb home and eat it along with his family as a sacrificial meal. It was taken back for them to sit down and consume and think about the price that had just been paid for their sin. But here's the problem. People kept on sinning. There was no end to their sin, so therefore there's no end to in sight to the sacrificing of these animals. You can see what this is. It's an imperfect system. Because it's never enough. So what could we do? Well, God knew there's only one thing that can be done. And this is what he planned from the very beginning. There needed to be one sacrifice made for all people for all time. And that perfect sacrifice is hinted at in the New Testament where we hear John the Baptist when he pointed to Jesus and he said, Look, there 
is the Lamb of God who takes away every sin of the world. And the Bible teaches us that Jesus was not just another good man. He was more than just a moral teacher. He was not just a prophet or a religious leader. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh who came to be one of us. And as a perfect man, he came to undo the sin of Adam. He died to identify with the sins of the entire human race. And as God, he came to take our place and to atone for our sin. You know, the entire sacrificial system in the Old Testament was never meant to be per permanent. It was a temporary stopgap because of what was pointing to the future. It was meant to give Israel a living picture of what it was going to be like when the Messiah, the Savior, came and He died in their place. Right. Isaiah prophesied it. He said, yet it was our weaknesses He carried. It was our sorrows that weighed Him down. And we thought His troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for His own sins, but He was pierced for our transgressions. For our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord has laid on Him the sins of us all. The Apostle Peter said it this way, He personally carried away our sins in His own body on the cross so we could be dead to sin and live for what is right. You have been healed by His wounds. At the Last Supper, Jesus said to His disciples, This is My blood, which seals the covenant between God and His people, it is poured out to forgive the sins of many. There's a legend told about in a particular Civil War battle that a small group of Confederate raiders were captured by a Union garrison and they were quickly determined to be war criminals and they were about to be executed. And as just before the order to fire was given by the firing squad, a single young Confederate soldier came running out of the nearby forest and he threw himself at the feet of the Union soldier in charge of the garrison and he began to beg for the life of one of the men who was w standing waiting to be killed. He said, that man's got a family back home. He's got several young children who are waiting for him. And he offered to take the man's place. It was an unusual request, but he granted it. And the convicted war criminal was released and the other man was executed instead. When the war was over, so it's told, the man who had been set free came back to the small cemetery where his substitute had been buried. And he erected a small headstone that simply says, He died for me. Now, I don't know if this is true or if it's just a legend. You know, I, I, I'll just tell you the truth. I don't know if this is a factual story or not. But one thing I do know. Jesus Christ was the perfect Lamb of God who died in your place that you might live. He was your substitute, the perfect sacrifice. His purpose was to give life in all of its fullness. He died for you. Amen. And just like with Abraham and Isaac, God has provided Christ as our substitute. He suffered and died in our place. Well, let me cover one more thing very quickly. That's the one we are striving to reach. How do we get there? We go through the priests. Only the priests in Israel were qualified to make the sacrifices required for people to approach the Holy of Holies. Now, just who were the priests? You had to be a descendant of Aaron. You had to be in his bloodline to serve as a priest. And the priest's function was 
to present the sacrifices to God. They were to seek God's guidance for the nation of Israel as well as for individual situations. Their job was to instruct people in the law of God and they often would serve as judges in certain cases and they were, they were the guardians of the covenant. And they also oversaw the, the tabernacle, later the temple, and all the, the treasures of, of Israel. They basically were the mediators who served between the people of Israel and God. So they represented the people to God by offering up the sacrifices and the incense and such, and by leading worship, and by praying for divine guidance. But they represented God to the people as they instructed them in God's law, and as they, as they worked through the sacrificial process. So in a sense, they were the channels through which God would communicate His will, and they served as living reminders that God forgives the sinning people. Now, among the priests, there would be one high priest. And the Old Testament high priest had one duty that set him apart from all of the others. He was the one, and he alone, once a year on the Day of Atonement, would take sacrificial blood, and he would approach the Holy of Holies. Now, the Holy of Holies is where they kept the Ark of the Covenant. The Holy of Holies represented the very presence of God himself. That's why, like I said earlier, they would tie a rope around his ankle because if his heart wasn't right and he would go into the presence of God, the fear of him being struck dead was real. And if he died, they weren't going in there after him. They would have to drag him out. Now, the New Testament presents Jesus as our high priest. Jesus, who entered heaven itself with his own blood. And as our high priest, Jesus made one sacrifice, and that was of himself, which won for all who would believe an eternal salvation. From Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 10. It says, For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sin. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Look at this, beloved. The Bible tells us that Jesus has fully completed the requirements to be our high priest. Kim put that up there because I want them to see those words. He has completely, he has fully completed the requirements. Amen. That means we don't have to offer sacrifice anymore. Because anything we might try to do is imperfect. But in him is perfection. Here are the requirements. He was divine and human. Hebrews 2 and 17 says, Therefore it was necessary for Jesus to be in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. He then could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. He's the only one who could do it. Besides that, he is sympathetic. Hebrews 4, 14 and 15 says, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he has faced all the same testings we do. Yet he did not sin. 
He was divinely appointed. Hebrews 5 and 5 says, This is why Christ did not exalt himself to become high priest. No, he was chosen by God who said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Besides that, he's sinless. Hebrews 7 and 26 says, He is the kind of high priest we need because he's holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has now been set apart from sinners, and he has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. Besides that, he's eternal. Jesus has already gone in there for us, according to Hebrews 6 and 20, and he has become our eternal high priest. And he is exalted. Hebrews 8 and 1 says, Here is the main point. Our high priest sat down in the place of highest honor in heaven. At God's right hand. You know why he could do that? Because he was perfect. And he was the perfect sinless sacrifice. He is the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. He is the perfect high priest who can stand before the throne of God and make intercession on our behalf. How many, of you, did, how many of you saw the movie Schindler's List? Any of you? It's not one that I would highly recommend because it's very intense. But in, in, in the movie, there is a, a couple who had clandestinely been, been married in the barracks of one of the uh, concentration camps. A uh, 24-year-old man named Joseph Ball and his bride was named Rebecca Tannenbaum. Rebecca Tannenbaum was the personal manicurist to the camp um, commander, the, the Nazi who ruled the camp. And when the camp was closed and they were going to move everybody to Auschwitz, and you know the history of Auschwitz, a man by the name of Oskar Schindler got permission to open a munitions plant in Czechoslovakia and he pulled workers from this closed prison camp to come work not to really make munitions as much as to try to save as many as he could and one of those who went was Joseph but the only reason Joseph was picked was because Rebecca his, his secret wife was given the privilege by the camp commander to pick one name to add to the list and she picked her husband Joseph you know in a sense Jesus did the same thing for us he sacrificed himself to add a name that could inherit eternal life and you know whose name he added? Yours. Yours. That's why we remember as Jesus was dying on, our, on, on the cross, he was doing so, so that our names could be written in the book of life. John 20 verse 31 says, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you will have life. If this doesn't excite you, beloved, if this prospect doesn't stir you, the only reason it would not do so is because you are not in right relationship with the Father. Oh, listen, you may be doing all the noble things that a Christian should be doing, but it comes down to this. Do you know Him as a Lord and Savior? Can you say with confidence that God is my Heavenly Father? Can you say, my sins have been forgiven and my name is written in the book of life that God keeps in heaven? If you have any uncertainty, beloved, but you desire to have the confidence to know 
that Jesus is your Savior and that God is your Father and that your sins have been forgiven. It starts as you, as you pray from the sincerity of your heart, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I don't deserve your forgiveness. But I believe that you died for my sin. And I want to turn from my sin. And you make the decision to live your life for him. You see, that's why the sacrifice of Jesus matters. Without it, we have no hope. But because of it, our hope springs eternal. Do you know Him? Have you received Him as a Savior and Lord? And I don't mean just, just mouthing the words of a prayer. Have you surrendered your heart and your life to Him? Have you turned your will over to His? And you've determined to live your life for Him. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we conclude this morning, this, this message today has reminded us of, of, of how high a price has been paid for us. And that without this high price, we have no hope of forgiveness of sin. But because of your great love for us, because you made us in your own image, and because you care for us so, you've made a way for us. You've provided what we cannot provide or find for ourselves. You've given us Jesus, your own Son, as a perfect Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice. And when Jesus was nailed to the cross, and as He shed His blood, and as He surrendered up His life, every one who might lay their hands upon the head of the sacrifice could be saved. Lord, I pray that if there's one here today who's never taken the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as the substitute for their sin, I pray that this will be the day of their salvation. I pray that this will be the day, this might be the hour, that they would say yes. That they would receive God's great gift of forgiveness through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We praise you, Father. We thank you for loving us that much. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stop.